it's time for the box office top 10. So obviously last week you reviewed Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, which I kind of just want you to say again, just for some giggles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem? You did it. You're great. Yes. There we go. Um, so it's not actually in the box office this week because it only came out on Monday, but I'll be interested to see what it's like next week because people have been loving that movie. Uh, at number 18 in the UK, Virgin Suicides, um, which we both loved. Uh, at number 14 in the UK, not charted in the US, is Malvka, The Forest Song. Dear Super Subs, I went to my local cinema this morning to see the Ukrainian... Uh, to see the Ukrainian animation Movka, the forest song in the English dub. And I loved it. It's a really sweet and beautifully animated film that wonderfully encapsulates both Ukraine's cultural heritage and its current inspiring perseverance. We live in an era of children's animations that carry profound messages of equality, optimism and compassion. To have created a film that continues this tradition and competes with the best that Pixar, Illuminations and Disney have to offer all while your country is at war with literal evil, is an incredible achievement. However, it wasn't the inspiring nature of the film that motivates me in writing this email. What's motivating me is that I was the only attendee at the screening today, and I think this film deserves better, and I hope that the Church of Wittertainment can help. It's a sweet film with limited peril that would be suitable for quite young children and adults alike. It deserves a wide audience. Help with the cultural exchange between Ukraine and the world. Help the help the Ukrainian filmmakers whose work is being stolen by Russian cinemas and enjoy a really fun kids film. Go and see Malvka, The Forest Song. Tinkity Tong and... Slava Ukraine. Thank you, Anna. That's from David in Cambridge. P.S. I've seen that the film is reviewed in this week's Take Two. I look forward to listening. Uh-oh. Oh, but I think it would be great if the intelligent, attractive, wise and magnanimous production team were to include correspondence on this film in Take One. <laughs> winky and face they have. And they have it worked the flattery absolutely worked thank you so much david i have to say anna and i were maybe less enamored with it than you were but i do really hope that people go and see it and that there are no more single attendees in cinemas i do think there is a really good point that he makes which is it is uh, incredibly appropriate for very young children yeah i think it's a good one to take you know toddlers very young kids too mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, UK number 10, not charted in the US, it's Bro. Uh, UK number 9, US number 10, it's Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. Uh, UK number 8, US number 9, it's Insidious, The Red Door. Uh, UK number 7, not charted in the US, it's Rocky and Rani, Kill Prem Kahani. At UK number six, US number seven, it's Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And at UK number five, US number six, it's Talk To Me. Mm-hmm. Fun fact, the film was made by the infamous Raka Raka brothers, who were known primarily as YouTubers, so people are loving seeing that they've made an A24 film. Yeah, good for good for the Filippo brothers. They are hilarious and so mad <laughs> to watch. They're extremely funny, but also the film is, it has been massively successful. I'm really happy to see it so high up in the box office charts after we reviewed it last mm -hmm. week. It was my film of the week last it week. Was. And I think it's been the highest grossing release for Altitude, who's the film's distributor, I think, in their history. No way. I think so, yeah. That's phenomenal. Good for everyone. And also for a horror movie. This is exciting stuff. And for an original horror movie. Not a sequel, mm -hmm. not a requel, not a remake, but an original first feature as well. It, I mean, I'll echo what I said last week on, in take one. It is deeply impressive that this is a debut movie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, when I interviewed them for my podcast, they talked about kind of having this Bible of mythology and this universe around the world of the of the hand. You'll know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about if you've seen if and when you say talk to me. But you know, I, I really hope they go on to do other things, but there is, they have established kind of a completely new potential horror universe. We have an email, dear Racker and Racker. This evening, I took a trip to the Phoenix Art Centre in Leicester to see Talk To Me. I was highly anticipating this one, being an A24 obsessive, you and me both, and a huge fan for many years of directors Danny and Michael Philippou from their YouTube videos. 
I thought the film was fantastic. Superb performances all around, particularly from Sophie Wilde and Alexandra Jensen. I agree with Anna's point last week that the smart thing about the film is its primary focus on one singular character, Mia. Combining personal tragedy with possession antics was a very moving experience and the use of the brothers' background in fast, over-the-top editing really powered this movie to the top of 2023's best for me. More than anything, though, even as just a fan, I just wanted to say how proud I am of Danny and Michael for getting this movie made. It's clear how much it means to them, and with the box office results being superb thus far, I really hope we get to see more of them on the big screen soon. Despite the initial reaction to the film being one of a disturbing nature, an hour on, I just feel happy that we have young filmmakers who have spent their lives dedicated to the art form who finally got their shot at the big time. I love them. All the best, That's Elliot. So that is adorable, can I just say. And we have another one from Kat who said, Hi, I'm not usually a horror fan, but Anna's enthusiasm encouraged me to see Talk To Me. And yes. I found it really enthralling. I was struck by the tactility of it. The filmmakers really connected the textures on the, textures on the screen to sensations I felt I could really sense in my fingertips. Sweaty skin, squelching gore, and the unsettling newspapery texture of the haunted house hand thanks and that's from Kat Megson thank you I am Kat Megson. so happy to be converting non-horror people to horror one person at a time thank you Kat for going to see it and that sound design for you baby that's what it feels like when it's that great god it must be so gratifying being you sometimes I love it at UK number four US number eight sorry do not, I don't, I don't know do, what that meant you by do that. not want to live in this head <laughs> At UK number four, US number eight, it's Elemental. Ahoy hoy, Antor Deck, <laughs> as always. Thank you for existing. I always seem to start an email to you both with a life event, and I'm afraid this email isn't any different. My mother passed away this year after a short battle with cancer. My six-year-old niece is reluctant to talk about it. Recently, Rowan and I went to see Elemental, our first cinema trip with just us two. I read her the code of conduct on the way to the cinema and baptised her with the prescribed blessed wittertainment water. This resulted in her being incredibly well behaved and she ate her popcorn like a ninja. I loved the film and I found it relatable as a son of Indian immigrants. I welled up on several occasions and afterwards I spoke to her about how my mum and father went through similar experiences when they immigrated from India, which, she, which seemed to bring about a glimmer of understanding from her. However, I do slightly resent the suggestion that the differences between us are as vast as the differences between the elements, when we're all in reality the same species of the Homo sapien. Kind regards, Shen. Uh, thank you so much, Shen. I'm so sorry to hear about your mother. Um, that must be just incredibly heartbreaking, but I'm glad that you found some solace in Elemental. At number three in the UK, number eight, Five in the US, it's Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1. And at number two in both the UK and the US, it is, of course, Oppenheimer. Dear back and to the left, JFK 91. Jesus. Nolan's latest is both an engaging and immersive experience, but ultimately a disappointing one. Cinematography is on point, and the usual suspects give outstanding performances. But even Nolan's pervasive, sub-honking soundscape cannot hide the impact of the cutting room carnage, evident as he tries desperately to slice a biopic courtroom drama and suspense thriller into the three-hour running time. The result is a first act that feels rushed and impatient, rather than pacey, and characters from Pew and Blunt that are largely wasted, when a more focused biopic treatment could have been awarded could have seen award nominations for either of them. Suspense is built up well throughout the Los Alamos Act, but the final courtroom denouement and its shonking and its shonky reveal felt like watching the air escape from a beautifully baked souffle. A disappointing lack of substance with whiffs of cheese, and that's from Tim in Tunbridge Wells. I'm a big fan of so film me, criticism via food metaphors. Yeah, me too. I was like, I um, love the cheese references. Um... I, yeah, I don't know what... I sort of... I do agree with you about uh, Pew and Blunt. They are largely wasted. Um, it almost feels like if you're going to... Ha why bother having women in this at all? I just, <laughs> just I, like I, fully lean into the... <laughs> what strikes me the most about that email is I wonder what he means by the traditional... I mean, I know exactly what he means by the traditional biopic treatment. And actually, I think that is the strength of Oppenheimer mm. is that 
it's not trying to fit into the mold that we see a thousand times over, especially around award season, mm-hmm. of the traditional biopic of a very consequential historical figure. Um, it is a filmmaker trying to make an art film, mm-hmm. a blockbuster art film. And only Nolan can do that because only he is afforded that kind of budget. I mean, yeah. one of the most interesting things, and I'm not going going to go into the Barbenheimer uh, thing again. One of the most interesting things about this moment in both those films is that they are essentially big budget art films mm-hmm. where they two very different filmmakers go wild with very... Um, with very pointed aesthetic choices. And I do think that Oppenheimer is a very new and interesting take on the traditional biopic. At times it is pulled back into that formulaic mm-hmm. nature, but when it's pulled out of it and when he goes, goes hog wild, that's when it shines the most. <laughs> I didn't find any of it tedious, actually. I loved, I did love all of it. And I I found, I found that sort of um, final third, especially with the, the horror elements that creep in, mm. incredibly disturbing. And again, the use of sound design. Oh, the sound design is Just glorious. absolutely pinned me to my seat, including the silence. Mm. Um, but thank you so much, Tim, in Tunbridge Wells. Dear Atom Bomb and H Bomb, me and my partner recently completed the much vaunted Barbenheimer over the space of two days at our local independent cinema in Brighton. Oh, which one? Also, should I call you the R bomb now? Call me the R bomb whenever you like, baby. Uh, please let me know which, which independent cinema you saw this in Brighton, please. As a history enthusiast and teacher, I was expecting to much prefer the Oppenheimer movie, but hope the Barbie movie would provide a little light relief. How wrong I was. First, Barbie. It's simply brilliant. Bitingly satirical, scathingly funny and a visual feast. Margot Robbie is brilliant, but Ryan Gosling steals the show as the fragile and narcissistic Ken. Its final sequence is also surprisingly moving as Barbie meets her maker. On Oppenheimer, however, the feeling was much more mixed. There is a brilliant movie in there somewhere, struggling to free itself from a much larger baggier movie. Murphy as Oppie is great. The scenes of the scientific planning and the execution of the bomb are also excellent, though I would have liked more of the moral struggle brought to the fore. However, the second half of the movie, after the bombs are dropped, spoiler, feels more like a total anticlimax. Frankly, I could care less about the congressional hearings and who said what to whom. Robert Downey Jr.'s character, though a total narcissist, is largely incidental and adds little of value to the film. Oh, he was not incidental, my friend. Blimey. Plus, the treatment of the female characters is at best cursory. Yeah, Yeah, that's true. Overall, a worthy movie, which, had it been an hour and a half long, would be a shoe-in for Best Picture. As it is, the longer it goes on, the less interesting it is. Perhaps Nolan just needs a better editor. Tinkety tonk and down with atomic warfare, Jack in Brighton. I find it really curious that it's the second email that has mentioned, you know, a, a failed attempt at the awards. Obviously, awards season has not started no, yet. We have no idea which how this is going to fall. I mean, we always have an idea, and okay, I think it's. I think it's really naive that people think that Oppenheimer does not have a shot at the yeah. awards because it's three hours long. It's going to get nominated. Yeah, they it's gone with Christopher the wind. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I mean, it, you know, there's we don't have the time and that's a whole other podcast about the mechanics and the politics of award season and film awards. But yeah, Oppenheimer is absolutely going to get awards attention. I mean, I will eat my shoe if... Your uh, shoe in. Eat your awards shoe in. It was a reference to Werner Herzog eating his shoe, oh, which I'm is a sorry. video that everybody should watch. It is available on YouTube for um, German cinema nerds like myself. But yes, <laughs> I will eat my shoe much in the vein of Werner Herzog if Killian Murphy is not nominated for an Oscar. Agreed. On to Barbie then, which is of course number one everywhere. Dear Barbie and Ken, I listened to the letter on last week's podcast from someone who felt people were uncritically consuming Barbie and its 90s messages and Anna's spirited and fierce response. I heard this prior to seeing Barbie and it stuck in my mind as I settled into the cinema. But were you wearing pink, Jenny? (laughs) Barbie was a riot. I laughed. I felt warmth in my heart and and my love for Ryan Gosling has blossomed out of control. But more than that, as I wake the next morning, all I can think about is that letter. 
I am a proud and staunch intersectional feminist, starting my uni's feminist society when none had existed prior, and now running a feminist society for my own pupils in the secondary school in which I teach. Jenny, my hero. I grew up with the messages of 90s feminism in all its girl power glory. Yes, Barbie has a very simplistic girls are capable message. And yes, some of its views are problematic. Don't get me started on how they portray the horror of cellulite. But it does critique Mattel and the very concept of Barbie. It does mock the idea that Barbie solved feminism by having the doll take on a number of roles. It does deconstruct elements of toxic masculinity. Yes, it is surface level introductory feminism. And yes, it is reminiscent of 90s feminism. But so what? Without girl power and the Spice Girls, a lot of women my age would perhaps be less vocal feminists. But we can now look back on that era and say, the feminism we were sold isn't good enough and here's why. And perhaps in 30 years, my niece's generation will be more advanced in their feminism than us and can look back at Barbie, their introduction to the patriarchy and all its oppressive issues, see the roots of their feminism and critically evaluate to move the cause forward. Up with introducing more people to the joys of feminism and fighting for equality, down with the woman behind me in the cinema who deemed Barbie too political. (laughs) Isn't it too political and not political enough? And here's to more and more young people being exposed to the fundamental flaws within society and becoming more proactive in recognising, acknowledging and fighting oppression. Tinkety tonk, Jenny. I think that's my favourite email. No notes. It's a great email. That's yeah. just fantastic. Five stars, no notes. I'd, I would have loved to have Jenny as a teacher. Yes, or a friend. <laughs> <laughs> just as a quick aside, I did a uh, a women's studies kind of subgroup in English literature. And my tutor at the time put her, said, can you put your hand up if you think that you're a feminist? And I was the only one that put my hand up in a in a class of you know, 30, 40 other young women who had also elected to take this. And she kind of looked at me and she went, well, that's one more than last year. Wow. And and it's that fear of, again, that sort of idea of feminist being a dirty word mm-hmm. is so frightening. And I'm so glad that people like Jenny are making sure that her students know that it is incredibly empowered word and it's mm-hmm. not frightening or dirty. So thank you, Jenny, for all your hard work. Firstly, appreciate the show. It's my go-to for film reviews and has been for a long time, so thanks to you all. So to Barbie, which I saw with my nine-year-old daughter recently, who loved it. As an aspiring feminist, which I love, it fell very nicely within her development for both film and the issues within, i.e. patriarchy and so on. However, I would like to invite your comments on its very, very binary approach to gender. There is man, Ken, and woman. Barbie. That's it. Nothing in between. For me, this seems out of touch with the current climate, missing a chasmatic trick in the process. It would have been a great opportunity to embrace the gender spectrum and the LGBTQ plus community in the process. I consider myself non-woke, to be down with the kids, but found it offensive in its narrow and short-sighted approach. Can I just say, it doesn't sound like you're non-woke, it sounds like you're woke (laughs) and that's equally not a dirty word. Overall, for me, it was a three and a half star movie. My daughter, of course, would say a five, but then she can be quite hyperbolic. Maybe around a four there. Mm, This started off as quite a strong email. All the best and keep up the good work. Cheers. You don't have to correct your daughter's enjoyment uh, enjoyment and personal rating of a movie. If it's a five star for her, and as an aside, I mean, it is incredibly reductive to rate films via stars. But if we're choosing to use that... Just let her have five, her five star experience. And what you can is have your three you? and a half, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't mean it's a four because her take is, quote, hyperbolic. It's hyperbolic to you, not to her. So Harry Neff is one of the Barbies. Yes, she is. Harry Neff is a transgender woman. Yes. Uh, it's not explicit in the movie that she is a transgender Barbie. Yes. I didn't think it needed to be. Me either. What do you think about this in terms of the the spectrum of gender being portrayed in the Barbie movie? I think in the midst of that, like, strange email, there is a point um, that I also kind of felt, and I'm not exactly sure where I stand on it personally or politically. It is, the Barbie world does imply a a strict gender binary, doesn't yes, it? Despite it is, the lack of genitalia. Exactly. It's the it's the Kens and the Barbies. Mm-hmm. And then there's Alan. 
But in that in itself is kind of weird. But I wonder, again, uh, I am absolutely still kind of wrestling with my own um, thinking about this. Is the is part of the satire about this gender binary, about the fact that, you know, not all Barbies are made the same, not all Kens are made the same. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it kind of, they are, but also they aren't. It's a complicated Strangely simplistic complication, right? Because on the one hand, all the Barbies are Barbie. They're all a part of one, but then they're all very different Barbies mm-hmm. to each other. And the thing about the Kens is that they're all so they're all very different as well, but they're all just Ken. Mm-hmm. And then there's Alan. Mm-hmm. So it's this weird world where the binary is enforced, but it's not making anyone particularly happy and is really fragile yeah and even when you know i'm not gonna go too much into what happens in the movie even when that binary is challenged the only character that sort of keeps their head on their shoulders and sees things as they're unfolding and understands this is not good for anyone is Is alan Alan. yeah so he's kind of like the unsung hero and he does not fit in this binary i'm not talking about the gender binary necessarily i'm talking about kind of the binary of the world of the barbies and the kens and who he aligns himself with he's supposed to be ken's best friend but he sees that what he's doing is wrong he's like in the Sadiq Khan advertising that's going on at the moment he's the May guy I don't know if you've seen this campaign um, where Sadiq Khan is getting um, men to call out their friends um, toxic behaviour by going May Alan is going May in this film film. yeah but yeah that's a it's a very it's a very curious kind of talking point thank you so much Chris Uh, a lot of food for thought there but please do allow your daughter to enjoy films Um, (laughs) I'm sure you do and we're just winding you up if you want to get in touch with any of your comments about the top 10 or anything that we've covered then please do drop us a line at correspondence at kermodemayo.com thanks very much for watching this video I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it while you're here check out all the other videos because they're cool too aren't they yeah and if you want to keep up to date with everything Kermode and Mayo's take then check out our social channels I mean why wouldn't you I mean I I would I have done excellent